What up, and welcome to Chapter 35 of Traditions and Encounters, The Age of Anxiety. Following World War I, there was an era of post-war pessimism. The Lost Generation refers to a group of U.S. and European thinkers who described the pessimism of the times after the war. Their poetry and fiction focused on the disillusionment with Western culture and the devastating effects of the war. There's also a time of religious uncertainty and pessimism, where people were wondering why Christianity, which was the primary belief of the time, had allowed such devastating effects to occur, and why God had allowed such bad things to happen to people, all the millions of deaths during World War I. Also, there were I attacks on the ideal of progress. So science was tarnished because people saw the technological horrors of World War I. Example was the use of mustard gas and other poisonous gases against people. Many intellectuals were also disillusioned with democracy. They saw that democracy couldn't always work and stand together, especially in times of war, and they pointed to the fact that the Russians had converted themselves to communism as a sign that democracy wasn't, was on the decline. However, during this time, there were also revolutions in physics and psychology. Albert Einstein, famous scientist, he came up with his theory of relativity around this time, where he said that space and time were relative to the people measuring them. So it's not a set amount. It's all based on interpretation, how you see it. There's also implication, which is the reality or truth is merely a set of mental constructions. It's really how we view it. It's not necessarily a set amount that other people state it is for us. There's also many challenges to the atomic universe and new advances in science during this time as well, such as the subatomic particles. Truth costs and effect, and also Freud's psychoanalytic theory. This was a pioneering thought in psychology at this time. Sigmund Freud is basically the father of modern psychology, and he thought that psychological causes of mental illness were unknown at the time, and he wanted to find them. He thought that there was this conflict between the conscious and the subconscious in mental processes, and as humans, we all have battles between these two. He was also very fascinated with sexual repression, and he thought it was the cause of a lot of issues, so he tried to make sexual liberty more prominent at this time. His ideas shaped this psychiatric profession and influenced lots of literature and arts, and as said before, he's the father of modern psychology. During this time, there was also experimentation in art and architecture. This was known as the avant-garde, where modern painting and photography really came into play. So the thinking was, if photography could reproduce nature, why should people still paint? Photography was a new technology at the time. Painters like Pablo Picasso sought freedom of expression and emotional expression, not as abstract as they had before. They also borrowed artistic traditions from around the world because trade was more common during this time and art traveled a lot further. And a big key piece of this time was there was no widely accepted standards of good or bad art. It was totally up to interpretation. Modern architecture also grew, so the Bauhaus school was started in Germany. It gave way to this new architecture of the industrial age, which included steel frames and walls of glass because these new technologies enabled new skyscrapers to build and cities to dominate. And this was the international style that was seen in many urban landscapes even after the 1930s. Economically, the world was suffering a bit because there was a global depression, better known as the Great Depression. The global economy was really weak after World War I because of tangled financial relationships. Germany and Austria had to borrow money from the United States to pay reparations, or basically fines, to the Allies because they had started the war, according to the Allies. And the Allies used these monies to pay war debts that were owed to the United States. The Allied countries of Western Europe, like France and Britain, they borrowed a lot of money to purchase U.S. arms and materials to fight this war. So it was basically a loop where the U.S., was lending money to Austria and Germany, that money went to Britain and France, and that money went back to the U.S. So it's kind of like maybe no one's really getting any money out of this. Um, by 1928, U.S. lenders, who were the big bankers at the time, withdrew capital from Europe because they saw it wasn't really turning up much for them, and the financial system became more strained. 
Also, industrial innovations reduced demand for raw materials. These innovations made production much faster, more efficient, and a lot better, especially rubber, coal, and cotton, and so people didn't need as much raw materials. There's also post-war agriculture suffered in places where war had damaged much of the croplands. The crash in 1929 was probably the biggest point of this depression, and it was the worst. The United States economic boom that was the Roaring Twenties, the 1920s in the U.S., led many people to speculate or invest in stocks that they couldn't afford. So they would borrow on credit, which means they would buy this amount of stock but only pay a certain amount up front and try to pay the back the rest later when they got more money. And this was bad because people were buying a lot of stock but they didn't have the actual money to back it up. Black Thursday on October 24th, 1929 was when stock prices started dropping and many investors lost their life savings. Lenders kept on holding their loans, forcing investors to keep selling, and you see this bad cycle of money perpetuating. This economic contraction in the U.S. economy affected the world because the U.S. was the dominant economy, one of the dominant economies during this time after World War I. The U.S. was one of the dominant economies in the world at this time, and overproduction by American businesses and reduced consumer demand, so consumers didn't want to buy all these new products, so products were just sitting in surplus led many businesses to fail and then unemployment occurred because businesses weren't making money to pay their workers. In an effort to try to raise more money to fix this depression, the government put tariffs on goods coming into the United States and of course because everyone else was just as broke, this didn't really work out to benefit the United States. Export prices declined in places where they were exporting natural resources to industrialized countries so this didn't help at all. Some countries, such as China, were not integrated into the world economy, and because they weren't dependent on other countries, they were less affected, but they were still affected because this was a global depression. Economic nationalism was over big. People really wanted their country's own economics to be good. They didn't really care about the international economics and the trade of other countries. High tariffs, import quotas were placed to try to promote economic self-sufficiency, prevent cheaper goods from other countries from coming in and demolishing the industries of a country's own industry. U.S. trade restrictions, such as the tariffs, were provoked retaliation by other nations. So once other countries saw the U.S. put tariffs on them, they put tariffs on American goods too, and this surplus couldn't be sold. Government, of course, tried to do something, but it didn't really work out. And the Great Depression caused enormous personal suffering. Many people didn't have the basic necessities of life. Marriage and birth rates declined. Suicide increased. There were many problems. John Steinbeck wrote the famous Grapes of Wrath during this time, which criticized U.S. policy of handling this issue. However, there was economic experimentation. So John M. Keynes or Keynes challenged the classical economic theory of laissez-faire where capitalism was self-correct itself and it was operated best if unregulated. He thought that depression was a problem of inadequate demand, not necessarily supply. So he thought if government played a more active role in stimulating the economy by pumping money and investing money into the economy, this would provoke consumers to want to spend their money again and help the economy again. So one person who implemented this was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His New Deal in American History took these ideas and it protected a banking system so banks wouldn't fail again, had massive public works projects known as public works of the New Deal, and also farm subsidies to help the farmers who were struggling at this time in the global market as well. Legislation also tried to protect workers, so minimum wage, social security, and workers' unions rose during this time. And military spending in World War II ultimately did help end the Depression in the United States. So it wasn't just these Keynesian economics, as they called it. It was eventually another war had to pull the U.S. and much of the world out of depression. Challenges to the liberal order. Many people thought democracy was failing at this time, so they looked to Russia to see if communism was was any good. In the Civil War of Russia from 1918 to 1920, the Bolsheviks fought the anti-communist forces known as the Whites. In the Red Terror, secret police of the Bolsheviks arrested and killed many Whites, and Bolsheviks even executed the Tsar, Nicholas II, and his entire family in June 1918. The Tsar had abdicated the throne a few months before. And despite some foreign support, the Whites were defeated by the Red Army, who were really powerful at the time. 
10 million died during the Civil War, and it was really bad on Russia. Lenin, Vladimir Lenin was the leader of the Bolsheviks, and during this time, he tried to promote war communism in an attempt to transform the economy. This policy included nationalizing banks, industry, church holdings, and even private trade was abolished, so he could have more control of the country at this time. Industrial output was also cut, so there's less supply, but the same amount of demand, hoping prices will go up and help the economy. Lenin then instituted his new economic policy, NEP, in 1921. This reversed war communism and put the market economy back. It allowed small-scale industries that have private ownership, and peasants were allowed to sell their other stuff. Electrification and technical schools were carried out to try to make Russia continually be more industrialized. However, Lenin died soon after in 1924, and a power struggle followed. The leader that emerged out of this power struggle was Joseph Stalin. He was known as the Man of Steel, and he favored socialism. Not international socialism, but just socialism for his Russia. He took out all his rivals and became the unchallenged dictator of the Soviet Union, which was Russia's name at this time. He instituted the first five-year plan from 1928 to 1932, which replaced the new economic policy, NEP. This set production quotas and central had central state planning of the entire economy. So this is kind of like the real communism, if you will. It emphasized heavy industry, so military buildup, at the expense of consumer goods, because Russia really wanted to prevent themselves from getting invaded by anyone again. Also, he collectivized agriculture, so states took out private farms and created large collective farms where people farmed together. This was supposedly more productive, and it could feed more industrial workers in the factories. Many peasants didn't like this, especially the wealthier ones, and, but regardless, most of the farms were collectivized, but the production wasn't always up there at, at the beginning. Many peasants were killed or starved in this process. So, as an alternative to capitalism, such as what the United States had, the Soviet Union did offer full employment for everyone and anyone, cheap housing and food so people could survive, but not many luxuries or consumer goods because, of course, the government is planning all the production quotas and food production, so you don't really have choice in what you want to buy. In the Great Purge from 1935 to 1938, there was a ruthless policy of collectivization which led to doubts of Stalin's administration. So he took out two-thirds of his government, basically, and took out the army's high-ranking officers because he thought he was going to get overthrown. And many people were sent to labor camps where they were supposed to be re-educated. This was really bad for the Russian people at this time. Fascism did rise in this period. Fascism was a new political ideology. It started in Italy, then went to Germany, where it's most famous. It didn't like liberal democracies, but it also didn't like socialism and communism. So that's really something people always get confused about. Fascism isn't even like communism. It actually is the exact opposite. It hates it. It's an extreme form of nationalism, which often included racism. You basically really love the state and love the leaders. Militarism is also big, so nationalistic tendencies want big militaries. Also, uniforms for many important people and parades to celebrate your country. Italian fascism started with Benito Mussolini, who was the leader, and his squads were called the Black Shirts at this time. They terrorized the socialists in Italy. And eventually, he was invited to be the prime minister by the king of Italy. So that's how he rose to power. Italy became fascist. All other political parties were banned. It was a one-party dictatorship, kind of like in Russia. And it was supported by businesses. They crushed labor unions and prohibited strikes of normal people. They didn't really hate Jews, so not much anti-Semitism until they allied with Hitler. Hitler was the leader of Germany's National Socialism, or Nazism, or Germany's Fascism. He was born in Austria, moved to Munich, and joined the German army in World War I. He really did not like Jews and Marxists, so those were like the communists. He joined a small group at the time, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and in 1923, the Nazi party tried to take over the Weimar Republic, which was Germany's government after World War I. But it didn't work, and Hitler was jailed. He was released, and then he tried to gain power. 
eventually Germans were sick and tired of themselves being kind of sucky after World War I, so they looked to a new leader. And his Nazi party had broad appeal, especially from the lower middle class, who were really poor at this time. The public didn't like democracy, they saw it didn't work, and it usually ended with defeat, depression, and inflation, like what the republics before in Germany had done. And the Nazi party was the dominant party. They promised a new beginning for Germany. The president at this time offered Germany and Hitler, sorry, offered Hitler Germany's chancellorship, so he became basically equally as powerful as the president. So he took up a lot of power, so did his Nazi party. They took over the military, especially civil service and judiciary, so it's kind of like a dictatorship. And their ideology mainly emphasized the purity of race. So they really liked wives and working mothers. And women were seen as people who should stay in the household. So they weren't really out there working. The cult of motherhood was their big propaganda campaign. It wanted to increase more births, of course, probably to boost the German army in a few years. Nazi eugenics used policies to improve the quality of the German race. They didn't like undesirables, according to them, who were mentally ill and disabled, and so these people couldn't have children. They also tried to get rid of physically and mentally handicapped people. So this eugenic policies is really frowned upon and seen as very inhumane these days. Anti-Semitism was the final core to the Nazi ideology. This was the hatred of Jews and other races, but primarily Jews at this time. The Nuremberg Laws were passed to take Jews out of citizenship and didn't allow regular Germans to marry with Jews. Jews lost a lot of their positions in government and also their roles in the economies. They lost their jobs, assets, and businesses. In 1938, in Kristallnacht, which was a very bad night where Nazis attacked synagogues and Jewish businesses and got rid of many Jewish establishments. Many Jews fleed but many were still trapped and eventually they would become victims of the Holocaust in World War II, which was the attempted extermination of the whole Jewish race. They ended up killing about six million and other races. So in conclusion, this has been chapter 35, The Age of Anxiety from Traditions and Encounters. Post World War I, but right before World War II, really how the world was reacting to the changing times. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.